Hello and welcome. I am Gohar Raza and you are watching Eureka. Today we have an honor of having Dr. Swami Nathan, father of Green Revolution in India. The Green Revolution that is one of the most important turning points in the history of the country. The same Green Revolution which brought us out of droughts, floods, miseries and dependence on other nations. Before that, one of the most popular name was PL480. This Green Revolution erased the name of PL480 scheme from the country's contemporary history. Welcome, Dr. Swami Nathan. It's Thank an you honor to much. shake your Real hand. pressure, real pressure. Before we go into Green Revolution and that debate, which would be the most interesting part of this segment, I would like to ask you, how was your life shaped because your family was involved and very intensely involved in Swadeshi movement temple entry movement. It was a Gandhian family. Your father was a surgeon, yet he got involved into freedom movement with all the zeal. Were you not neglected as a child? Well, early education was an ordinary school, nothing particular school, neighborhood school as you will say, or native high school, then after my father died, left from high school. But my father, was a very strong nationalist, like most people in those days, and a strong follower of Gandhiji. I remember Mahatma Gandhi staying in our house in Kumbagonam, and uh, early impressions were very strong. And my mother was also a Gandhi and uh, insisted that we should spin a charka at least one hour every day to make our cloth. Because I, idea, I did that. Uh, at least seven or eight years my early childhood, every day that used to be more or less mandatory. And, but it gave, all these gave some lessons because the charka I represented as one, instead of sending your raw material cotton abroad to Lancashire, make the cloth yourself. Why do you want to, in other words, self-reliance, uh, Swadeshi and self-reliance become part of my conviction. And my, my, my father was a Gandhian, a uh, very successful medical doctor and a very popular one because he never used to ask money. If they give the money, he will take it, otherwise he won't. But that town of Kumbhakonam was full of filariasis, elephantiasis, and major problems of mosquitoes. And my father felt that mosquitoes are not God-given. Uh, they have been man-made. Therefore, just praying for God alone won't help. We have to take action to eradicate it. So he stood for election as a municipal chairman of the Kumbhakonam town. Everybody elected him. And within one year, he got rid of the mosquito. For simple, I was in a school. Each one of us was in the school was taught where the mosquito is breeding in that particular street. If you don't want that breeding ground, you close it. If you want it, you spray crude oil emulsion. In other words, purely education and social mobilization, not by regulation, law, and so on, mosquito was eradicated. That has always remained the with me. Scientific awareness Remember, and awareness, social mobilization, education. Where does the mosquito breed? Why does it breed? And so on. Within one year, that town, notorious for elephantiasis, big legs, and so on, uh, became free of it. So some of my early, and then my mother, uh, I recall when Gandhiji came, I was a very young boy. Uh, my mother had told me. In those days, it was common for middle, middle class people in South India uh, to wear a bangle or wear a chain or wear a earring. Uh, whether you are son or daughter, it doesn't matter. So my mother had told one man will come this evening, he will ask for all the ornaments. Don't say you can't give, you give it to him. That was Mahatma Gandhi. And he did ask, why are you having it? You give it to me. Then I, later on, I asked my mother, what does he do with all this? He says he, he auctions it and uses for origin welfare for him, because this is superfluous in your body, what is not needed, you must give away. That is how all my prices, everything in the later life, uh, whatever I have given away uh, for this foundation, for example. You were not irritated, you didn't feel bad that this old man uh, 
very old with a lathi probably asking for everything no, that you true. had that is true price position prices were came but what i meant was i think what is important is surplus your requirement i believe in gandhi ji saying you be a trustee of your wealth not a owner not a owner you concept of trusteeship whatever you need for your life you take so otherwise that is you give what away. was almost injected in your blood that love for others giving up position very strong i would say very strongly from the childhood largely from my father because uh, in our house who was your role model mother or father a difficult question who was your role model your father my role or your model mother? my father was but my father died in 1936 when i was just 11 years old but uh, some of the impressions uh, which he left are indelible the other were the school teachers and my mother my mother was so self sacrificing she was not never never make any complaint uh, i just when my father died our income went down very steeply she adjusted to a new life without any difficulty so both parents were very important will you say that that shaped your life your teachers also shaped your life it is was a very important stage in the life because those all lead when i became later on a teacher at the indian agriculture research institute i used to remember what a good teacher should do and so they remain some of these are indelible remarks it makes sense in your but i must also say my transition in life when my father died uh, he had built a very big hospital a very big hospital and uh, my he trained his younger brother to be a radiologist younger brother narayan sami the hall where we are sitting now is called the narayan sami hall because he is the one who brought us up when my father died my father's younger brother but uh, with all this kind of uh, attitude of uh, trying to Uh, build up a hospital my mother felt i should go to a medical education when i finished my graduate degree and st- go back to the hospital run it that is where a great change took place i was at that time in the maharaja's college in trivandrum lot of people wanted you to become lot of uh, thing uh, personality uh, later also in life we'll come back to that i have to take a break don't go anywhere we are talking to dr MS Swaminathan we'll come back soon welcome back to eureka dr ms swaminathan we were discussing about your education your mother wanted you to be a doctor and your father was your role model but you started doing zoology and suddenly shifted to botany how did the transition come about well i was uh, studying at the maharaja's college trivandrum because my father's elder brother was then the chief secretary to the government of travancore and since my father was no more he said why don't you come and study here at that time 1942 gandhi ji gave the quit india call uh, and uh, uh, there was very clear feeling that india is going to become independent so we had a small students club there where we used to discuss issues and one day they came uh, how can we help independent india unfortunately at the same time when the quit india movement was called there was a great bengal famine 42 43 and i could see from the newspapers the front pages millions of many people millions died. of people several about 300000 more than 3 million children women and men died out of hunger then when it came in a round table what each one can do to for a independent india i spontaneously said i would like to see that there is no hunger there is no hunger uh, the bengal famine should be a problem of the past in independent india and therefore i want to shift from medical side to agricultural side well that was a big shock in a way uh, to my mother and others in the house suddenly i said i go to the agricultural college in coimbatore and not to the medical college in madras got admission in both then i joined agricultural college at coimbatore and then decided to enter a field which can make the maximum impact that is genetics and breeding but before that you were asked to apply for uh, indian administrative service and indian police service and that, that was when i went to delhi 
to further improve my qualification in the field of genetics and plant breeding because I thought the best way of making the largest contribution is to have new varieties which every farm particularly suited for small and marginal farmers. When I went to Delhi to join the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, popularly called the POSA Institute, uh, for my postgraduate work, uh, one of the officers in the Krishi Bhavan, uh, who, who was a collector in my town, he knew the family. He said, why have you come to agriculture? It has no future. Sit for the competitive examination and join the civil service. So he filled up the form and I <laughs> sat, sat and I was selected for the Indian police service. I still have the uh, orders of the government of India from the home we ministry. You would have lost a first <laughs> great scientist <laughs> appointed and, me. and a nationalist. Uh, well, I had no idea of joining any service, not only police service, administrative service. Uh, because then I applied for a fellowship to go to Holland. Because Holland is a land of small farms, very good farmers. And, uh, and you knew that, that you wanted to go only to Holland and this was the I, reason. I was clear that hereafter my future is in the field of agriculture. Agricultural research, not agriculture. I could have become a plantation manager. That was not the idea. Agricultural research, particularly I research which is pro-small farmer which can be oriented towards the technology should not be so complicated that they, it is not available to uh, resource poor farmers. Uh, so I went to uh, Holland, worked on potatoes because they asked me to work on potatoes because during World War II. And you were at that time recognized by peers that you are a brilliant scientist. I started, uh, in fact I must tell to the, uh, to the credit of the Home Ministry I wrote to them that I have got a fellowship, UNESCO fellowship to go to Holland, so I can't take up the IPS. Uh, but I had also sent a copy of the UNESCO fellowship. That was one year. So one year later, uh, Dr. Mohan Sinha Mehta was our ambassador in The Hague, the first ambassador. And uh, he rang me up one day and said, there's an offer from the Home Ministry for you, uh, for IPS. I was taken aback. I went to Holland. They said you had said you are going for studies for one year that one year is over. If you are still interested, uh, we are posting you in Assam. But that was very nice of them to have uh, done that. Anyway, I wrote to them, I am very sorry, my misunderstanding. I have no... Ch then I went to Cambridge, did my PhD, also on potatoes. And when I was in Cambridge, I published a few papers which attracted international attention. And I was invited by the University of Wisconsin, the United States, to set up a potato research center at Sturgeon Bay in Lake Michigan. So for four, from 1949 to 54, uh, first in Holland one year, two years in Cambridge for a PhD, and about one and a half years in Wisconsin. But all through you had this at the back of your mind that you will come back to India after getting trained there and serve the country. I was very clear on that because in fact, in, when I was in Wisconsin, I was offered a very, fine, very good position as associate professor for a young man. It was very, in fact, the president invited me for a breakfast and uh, I told him, sir, my in intention of going abroad was to equip myself to serve my country. So the question of settling abroad doesn't come at all. He was very moved and he said, you are my blessings. But then when I came back uh, in uh, 1954... But was it, was it that you wanted to help the poor in the country because of 1942 uh, experience or was it because you wanted to build a new India? I said India is an agricultural country. At that time, nearly 75% of the people were in agriculture. An agricultural country going and depending upon other countries for food is a shameful one. So my whole ambition was uh, to ensure food self-sufficiency in the country and secondly, the food to be available at affordable cost to everyone non-dependent upon imported food because even, even now I'm fond of saying the future belongs to nations with grains and not with guns. Guns you can purchase, grains you cannot purchase. We have to go the PL480 way to get the grains and so on. Therefore, uh, my broader goal, not as a, I don't want to exaggerate what one individual can do. It was very clear that uh, we have to work with the political system. Scientific leadership in the country and the political leadership in the country, they were working in unison and that brought out results? That is exactly correct because unless there is synergy between technology and public policy, technology can show the way 
but only public policy can see whether that we, we realize the potential or not. Therefore, we were fortunate in the 60s. For one thing, the country was desperately in need of more food. And uh, we were uh, having a very bad time, uh, depending upon PL 480 wheat, because that uh, obviously needed some compromises uh, in management, fiscal management, in external relations management. So both Bilal Bodhu Shastri ji, who gave the coin, who coined the term Jai Kisan, Jai Jawan, right. he was very clear. He was very clear because I had the good fortune of meeting him and talking to him several times. He was an agriculturist at heart. But despite all the support from political uh, leadership in the country, you had immense problem in, in inviting Dr. Norman to India. Uh, who was a big figure. I was about to say we were lucky at that time to have you had met him. Lal Bahadur Shastri on one hand, who brought C. Subramaniam, who was a great believer in science, one of the greatest politicians of our country, political development or political leaders, C. Subramaniam. So I had wanted to go into short varieties of wheat so that we can apply a little more water, a little more fertilizer. Uh, and they were available with Dr. Norman Borlaug in Mexico. They were also available in the United States, but U.S. varieties were not suitable for us. They are called winter wheats. So I sent a proposal, I think in the late 59, 60, early 60, uh, to send an invitation to Dr. Borlaug uh, to come and also bring his material. But it took nearly two and a half years to go because the, the file says, why is this man to be invited? <laughs> what can we learn from him? He is from Mexico and so on. Uh, but fortunately... Had it been somebody from maybe United <laughs> States yes. or the UK, it would fortunately, have been much easier. Fortunately, C. C. intervened and it was helpful too. And later on, Indira Gandhi came. When Indira Gandhi came in 1966, we were importing 10 million tons of food grains. And once when Dr. Vikram Sarabhai and I called on her for something else, for Krishi Darshan program in the Doordarshan, Vikram was very keen to take the technology to the field through television. When we went her, she looked at me and said, Swaminathan, how soon can we build a reserve of 10 million tons? Because that year, we had imported 10 million tons under PL 480 wheat. It had stuck in our brain. And uh, it was very, I was taken aback. I said, Madam, uh, if we do everything right, in another five years, we should build up a 10 million ton reserve. And by 1971, this happened. It happened. It did not always happen, but it happened. And uh, she released a special stamp called the Wheat Revolution in 1968. So the political leadership, the administrative leadership like Mr. B. Shivaraman, an outstanding ICS officer, who drew his lessons from the field, not from the files. There are many who go only by files. He, 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 he drew his policy from the field. Every morning he will come, we both go around the field and uh, what is new and so on. So we had an unusual combination, what I call a symphony orchestra, like a symphony. Uh, no jarring sound. The scientists, the administrator, the political leader, all of them came together. And that built the India. That is how a revolution today. could take place. You can't, you see, in four years' time, our farmers produced more wheat than the previous 4,000 years. Therefore, that's why it's called a revolution. Uh, from Mahanjadaro to 1966, and 1966 to 1970, uh, production was more in the four years than the previous 4,000 years. It was a different country. I have to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back. Welcome back. Dr. Swami Nathan. India experienced that revolution. You became a household name everywhere. Not even, not, not only in, in metropolitan towns and uh, research papers you became a household name in villages because the village, the farmers, the Indians were thankful to you. Now when you look back, you have done first-rate research. You have brought about this revolution. Where will it take us in future? Well, the revolution was the product of a combination of characters. Technology was a primer of change. Farmers own enthusiasm, political will, all of them came together and uh, people, uh, farmers appreciated. We have, uh, we have a challenge again because the population has grown. 
there are climate change and other kinds of problems are going to come. That's why eternal vigilance is the price of stable agriculture. I coined the term evergreen revolution because uh, many environmentalists uh, criticize the green revolution from two angles. One is ex excessive use of pesticide, excessive withdrawal of groundwater so that the, and salinization of soil and so on. So, but, but even no, in 1968, you warned the country that excessive use of fertilizer and excessive drawing of water, subsoil water, will lead to problems. In my Science Congress address in 68 at Varanasi, right. January 68, I, do recall. I did warn, I didn't warn the people because I saw in some cases what but I call the Green Revolution. But some people still hold you responsible Green for Revolution that. Green Revolution was becoming a greed revolution. Right. There is nothing wrong with Green Revolution. In my speech I said, uh, we should be very cautious. Uh, we must have integrated pest management, integrated nutrient supply, everything in moderation, not in high. So and that's what they people, call the evergreen revolution. Yeah, some people still hold you responsible for that. But you have been warning against it. Now, how do you think that we should move forward now when the situation in the country is that it's going to take another turning point probably. See, what people have to realize is inputs are needed for output. You need, the plant requires also some nutrients to give output. Uh, but how do you give those inputs in a way that do not have long-term uh, harm? That is why I coined the term evergreen revolution, which I define increase in productivity in perpetuity without ecological harm, without associated ecological harm. This can be done now. We have technologies. We can produce more and more without harm to the land. You give back to the land what you have taken out. Partly uh, today organic farming is becoming popular. Organic farming uh, is, can be practiced pro by provided you have access to a large number of animals or cow dung or cake and so on. So I think we should, uh, we should not forget ecology, uh, what we call eco-technology, mainstream environmental conservation in technology development and dissemination. This particular center, for example, is designed only for that purpose of mainstreaming environmental considerations in technology development and dissemination. So, science shows the way you can either use or abuse science. <laughs> Some people argue that now Indian society and economy has to get into the transformative mode from agrarian society to industrialized society. Do you agree with that? I don't agree because agrarian society in our country is the majority of society. And you can do without anything but not without food. So uh, from the dawn of humankind, the very first agriculture was the first beginning of civilization, of settled communities. Therefore agriculture has to coexist. Now you can go two ways. One is highly industrialized agriculture, like what developed countries have done. Uh, all are machine made. But a country with us with already 1.2 billion population, which is likely to become 1.5, uh, the jo jobless growth is characteristic of modern industry. Job-led growth is characteristic of agriculture. We cannot afford but to take the job-led growth pathway. F f ag we have to give away. So I would say agriculture, but modernized agriculture. Even now, well, there's mechanization. There is use of IT very much, the mobile phone as a source, because the monsoon and the market are the two major impediments to a farmer's own income. So the monsoon and the market both can be predicted by, uh, they, they have good knowledge how to manage them and so on. So modern extension has become much more effective as a result of new technologies. The younger generation is not going to be attracted to agriculture. Uh, unless there is some intellectual satisfaction in addition to income. And uh, we have now to concentrate on how to attract and retain youth in farming. And uh, in the National Commission on Farmers, we had given a lot of thought to it and suggested methods by which the young people, both by modern technology on one hand and assured and remunerative marketing. For example, I had recommended that the price of procurement price must be C2, that is all cost of production, plus 50 percent margin. Some people think it's too much for a farmer. After all, the farmer is also <laughs> another Indian. He has to have all, not only food. As he said, man does not like live by food alone. You need other things. So I don't believe that we can go purely industrial, industrialized country. 
we should look at both industrialization and agriculture as those which will be mutually reinforcing each other, not antagonistic. Your work as a scientist, as a social reformer, as a person who transformed India has been recognized. And this room where we are sitting is a witness to more than 250 shields, <laughs> certificates. Count. I did count and I couldn't count the, the shields in the other room. So your work has been recognized and I'm very happy that uh, a shield from United Nations is, is uh, uh, sitting side by side from a message uh, that was given to you by school children. So you don't distinguish between very high and uh, very, very ordinary uh, recognition by ordinary person. Uh, however, which award did excite you most? Well, as you say, there are so many awards and I'm grateful to all those because it's an encouragement. It's an encouragement that you are going on the right line or uh, that's how I consider it because the award do not stay in my mind. But one occasion I still remember was 1968 when Indira Gandhi declared the Green Revolution. There was a very big gathering of farmers. They had invited her to come and open a seed cooperative. Suddenly the chairman of the seed cooperative asked Indira Gandhi uh, to put a medal on me, saying that he, this is the man <laughs> responsible for it. Now, I think that is worth than any other award, <laughs> any other award. Coming from the, from, from the clients of Probably farming. illiterate you, uh, uh, farmers. As I told you as last time in Amritsar, when the farmers recalled what I did 50 years ago, it's a source of encouragement, it's a source of satisfaction that you have done something which has been useful to your fellow human beings. Though I would like to continue the discussion, but before we sign off, may I request you to give a message to younger generation? I want to remind them what Nehru once said, the future belongs to science and those who make friendship with science. I said make friendship with science. You may not be a scientist, but you may not get away from the superstition, get away from all the things, wrong things which are happening in our society. And I think make friendship with science. I think it's a beautiful word. The future belongs to science. And so we must, modern technology is leapfrogging. Modern information technology, they are transformational technologies. They transform the way in which you communicate, they transform the way in which you live. Uh, and, and in which you think. Yeah, and say. So, uh, in my time, uh, we were struggling to get opportunity. Here there are opportunities awaiting young people. And grab it. India is a land of opportunities. And the future belongs to science. Make friends with science. That is the message we take home today. For now, that's all. We'll come back with one more outstanding scientist next week. Thank you for watching Eureka.